यसौ मुक्ति नंदन भज बर
Come on, ladies, let's go. We're beating you, come on. I know my boy, I love you, boy. I love you, boy. You know my boy, you you Yes, Mati Nandana, Braja Bhaganagara, Gokula Ranjana. Very, very good. Kinda. No, I'm not coming. His mother's calling him Kana. Nope. Not coming. <laughs> I'm playing. No time for food. <laughs> okay, so what should we talk about? The war in Ukraine? No. <laughs> The weather? <laughs> okay. Any suggestions? How to make pal budgie? No? No. 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 Any, any other suggestions? Padmanav. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I read your mind, okay. <laughs> yeah, so we'll speak about something that causes us most of the problems. In fact, it's the only problem. It's called the mind. Hmm. So in the uh, sixth chapter, Krishna very systematically gives a series of statements about the mind because it's called dhyana yoga and he starts to deliver the topic in the fifth verse Buddha read atman atmanam atmanam avasada yat atmaiva yatman ho bandhur atmaiva vipa atmanam one must deliver himself with the help of his mind and not degrade himself the mind is the friend of the conditioned soul and his enemy as well. Mm -hmm. And we'll read the next verse. Very difficult Sanskrit in this one. Bantur atmanaptasyan yenatmaiva manajita atmanaptas tu satruve varte tatmaiva satruvat For him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. Mm. So here, Krishna is giving us a clear understanding. Uh, there's no enemy or there is no real friend. With this whole, it's all based on the mind. The mind creates enemies and friends like that. And it becomes our friend if it helps us to become Krishna conscious and it becomes our enemy it takes us in the other direction. So here we'll read a little bit. 
The purpose of practicing Eightfold Yoga, that's the mystic yoga system, also known as Astanga Yoga, is to control the mind in order to make it a friend in discharging the human mission. Unless the mind is controlled, the practice of yoga is simply a waste of time. Mm. One who cannot control his mind lives always with the greatest enemy. And thus his life and his, his, its mission are spoiled. The constitutional position of the living entity is to carry out the order of the superior. As long as one's mind remains an unconquered enemy, one has to serve the dictations of lust, anger, greed, illusion, etc. But when the mind is conquered, one voluntarily agrees to abide by the dictations of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is situated within the heart of everyone as Paramatma. Real yoga practice entails meeting the Paramatma within the heart. So here's the point. Real yoga practice entails meeting Super Soul of God within your heart. And then, once you do that, follow his dictation. For one who takes to Krishna consciousness directly, perfect surrender to the dictation of the Lord follows automatically. And I'll read the next translation just because it helps us to get a broader picture of what it, the mind looks like when the mind is controlled. Chitatmanam prashantasya paramatma samam hitaha sitnosa sukadukeshu for one who has conquered the mind, the super soul is already reached. For he, that person has attained tranquility. To such a person, happiness and distress, heat and cold, honor and dishonor is all the same. Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasnaya Bhutale Shrimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauramani Pacharine Nirvase Sarasunyavadi Pastyatya De Sitarine Vanchakopa Turubhischa Kripa Sindhu Be Bhachapatita Nam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Srivasa Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So one who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. One who fails to do so, his very eye, uh, mind has become his greatest enemy. So there's when Prahlad Maharaj was being harassed by his father Harani Kasipu. And Prahlad was responding to Harani Kasipu by explaining how important it is to take shelter of Lord Vishnu. Although his father was trying to harass him in so many ways and actually trying to coerce him to uh, listen to his dictation. Uh, Prahlad was fixed. He was fixed on worshiping the Supreme Personality of God. He loved his father, but he knew his father was a demon who was against God. And so he had some compassion for his father, although his father was trying to uh, give him trouble by forcing him to listen to his the demoniac dictations. But Pallad simply ignored that, kept his mind fixed on the, the, the lotus feet of the Lord. And then when he started to glorify Lord Vishnu, Rani Kashipu became really quite angry. And then at one point he said, you are siding with my enemy because he had made Vishnu his enemy, his brother. Hiranyaksha was killed by Lord Vishnu in the form of Lord Bor. And therefore he wanted to take revenge upon Lord Vishnu because 
he, he was a demon. But, of course, no one can do anything to the Supreme Personality of God. But he made the Lord his enemy. And anyone who sided with the Lord was also his enemy. So when he uh, heard his son glorifying and encouraging him to surrender to Lord Vishnu, he said, you're siding with my enemy. <laughs> and Prahlad Maharaj said, my dear father, your, own, your only enemy is your own mind. <laughs> Your own, your own enemy is your own mind. Because uh, we make friends and enemies and we decide on what is, what we like and what we don't like by the dictations of the mind. Some day someone is our friend and the next day that same person is not anymore. <laughs> the mind keeps changing, it's always moving. The mind is compared to a river it's, it's called, it's consistency is liquidity. It's moving, it's flowing. It doesn't stay in one place. And therefore the mind is always moving through the different sense objects and the senses are all, and the mind is bringing in the sense objects that we like and it's pushing out the sense objects that we don't like or we don't desire. Well, the mind's business is to accept and reject them based on what we like. And therefore we see people like and dislike the same thing. Yeah. Because everyone's mind is conditioned in a certain way. But we have to understand that the mind is an instrument and it's not us. The thoughts that come into the mind are simply reflections of our desires, either in this life or in previous lives as we cultivate life in general, the mind is always full. When Yudhisthira Maharaj was being tested by his father, Yamaraj, in the form of a yaksha, the yaksha gave him 50 questions. And one of the questions is, what is more numerous than the blades of grass throughout creation. And Yudhisthira rightly answered, the thoughts in the minds of men. <laughs> if you could count how many thoughts you had per day, you would be in probably triple zeros. <laughs> in other words, the mind is always flowing through the, through, the, through the cosmos. But Krishna consciousness means to direct the mind by the intelligence and connect the intelligence to truth. <laughs> so the intelligence is a feature of the mind but, it is, but it's not exactly the mind itself because the mind has three characteristics. It thinks of something, gets a feel for that thought whether it's attracted or not attracted and then it accepts or rejects based on one's conditioned nature. I like it, I don't like it, I go for it, I don't go for it. Like that. Now in thinking, feeling, and then we say willing. Willing means action. But then there's the intelligence. Intelligence has two features. One is discrimination and the other one is determination. These are the two features of the intelligence. So the, the the mind has a tendency not to discriminate because it simply goes for what it likes and what it doesn't like, whether it's good or not. <laughs> You'll be sitting in your car riding along the road and you know, you're just watching all the billboards, right? <laughs> you're thinking, what am I watching all those stupid billboards for? But then you keep doing it. <laughs> it's just the mind is a rascal. He, he just doesn't <laughs> want to listen to it any good in, good instructions. So well, therefore Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say your mind is a, is your the mind is a non devotee. Let it go. So we're not supposed to associate with non devotees, right? <laughs> supposed to associate with devotees. So therefore we have to preach to the mind and make him a friend or make him a devotee. And to do that the discrimination between what is 
beneficial and what is not beneficial. Therefore, Sanatana Goswami, in describing um, the process of surrendering to the Supreme Personality of God, he, he makes six points. The first one is Anukulena, and the other one is Pratikulena. Anukul means to accept those things that are favorable for your progress in devotional service. And pratikul means to evaluate and understand those things which are unfavorable. So that discriminating factor comes from the intelligence. But the intelligence can also be just like the mind. They can be two enemies. Um, I'll give you a, an example. This is just to deviate slightly from the flow of the topic. Um, you, just to show you what's the difference between the mind and the intelligence. You're, you go, you, you're up on, high up on the building and you're looking down and it's really far down. And your mind says, jump. And your intelligence says, don't do it. <laughs> so, you know, you've got two voices there. The first one is your enemy. <laughs> And the second one is your intelligence. So that's common sense. You understand if I do that, then everything is, is finished. But the mind won't do that. It'll say, you know, that person is a rascal, go punch him. <laughs> but he won't, he won't figure out that what will happen to you after you do that. <laughs> so that's just the way the mind works. Therefore, the mind has six enemies. Kama, Krodha, Loba, Mohan, Matsarya and Madha. These are the six enemies of the mind, which are lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy. So these things are all, they are always attacking the mind, and at the same time, they're always in the atmosphere, particularly in this age of Kali. And the atmosphere is quite much, what we say, contaminated by uh, sinful activities and therefore this atmosphere one has to choose mm -hmm. to be in that atmosphere which is free from the influence of these external enemies although they still might be there in, internally and therefore one has to very carefully connect the intelligence so it's not like the mind to what is called knowledge or what we say truth, transcendental knowledge or transcendental truth, and that is to connect oneself with two things which are of the same nature and possibly three. And what is that? The words of the spiritual master, the words of Krishna which comes through Shastra, and the words of the great spiritual teachers that have come from the past. And we call that the triangle of truth. So it's called Guru, Sadhu, Sa Shastra. And Shastra refers to Krishna in this case. So when the mind, when the, that knowledge of Guru, Sadhu, and Shastra becomes what we say continuous in your practice of Krishna consciousness, using that to direct the mind with the intelligence based on this knowledge one is always moving in the right direction. But you see, the mind will work, the mind works 24 hours a day. <laughs> Even when you're not, what we say, in the uh, conscious state, you're in a dream state, which is a state of sleep, semi-sleep, not complete sleep. And then you have deep sleep. There's three states of existence. We call it waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. These are three states. In the dreaming state, the mind will reflect on the desi unfulfilled desires that are still within the heart and mind, and they also manifest themselves in the form of dreams. And many times one fulfills their desires and dreams. Or the mind connects itself from the waking state of the images that it, it uh, sees and then in the dream it throws those images in a helter skelter uh, combination and then you have what is called a crazy dream. <laughs> Just like Prabhupada would use the example, you see gold 
and then you see a mountain, and then you see in your dream a golden mountain. So the mind has a tendency to put together things that don't go together and comes out in the dream state. Yeah. So the mind is always like that. But you can understand one thing, you're not the mind. When you understand you're not the mind, and you have to learn to use the mind, then you can begin to control the mind. But if you listen to your, the dictations of the mind, then you're controlled by the mind. And if you control by the mind, you don't know where it's going to take you next, because it, ca it connects with the external environment, and then the senses become active in bringing in the sense objects into the mind, and then the mind starts to contemplate these things. Therefore, it says, Dayato Visayam Pumsam, Teshu Sant... Dayato Visayam Pumsam, what's the second, next line? Sango Sages Padayate, Sangat Sanjayate, Kama, Kama Krota Bijayate, Krota Bhavati Samoham, Samoham, Sriti Bri Mama, Sriti Brahmsa, Burinasa, Burinasa, Pranashyati, Pranashyati. So this is from Bhagavad Gita. It says here, while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. So when you see it's just like you see a a boy sees a girl, a girl sees a boy, and you start contemplating the enjoyment that one will project in a mental way, and then all of a sudden, one develops attachment for them. From attachment, lust develops within the mind, and from lust, anger arises. In other words, when lust is unfulfilled, anger comes. From anger, complete delusion arises, and one becomes bewildered. And from delusion, bewilderment of memory, you forget that you're a devotee. <laughs> when memory is bewildered, then your intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one again falls down into the material pool. That's all it's important uh, understanding here. That the intelligence keeps you free from the effects of the material energy. You have to strengthen your intelligence. And how do you straighten? We mentioned that by hearing regularly from Guru, Sadhu, Shastra. <coughs> and when intelligence becomes strong and the connection to Guru, Sadhu, or Shastra becomes regular, then in this verse we read, one who has conquered the mind, then the super soul is already reached. So for those who have, been, who have mastered the practice of Bhakti Yoga, they're hearing Krishna within the heart and Krishna's telling them what to do and what not to do. He's guiding them, he's protecting them, he's directing them, and at the same time he's purifying them. So that is the super soul. So Krishna in the heart is always telling us constantly, 24-7, what we should be doing or how we should be thinking. And if, we, if we're able to connect to super soul, then you are actually on the spiritual platform. But before then, to get on the spiritual platform, you have to hear from Guru, Shadu, and Shastra regularly, not intermittently or whenever the, uh, the time appears. One has to hear regularly because the mind is a conditioned element and it's not something that's been with us just in this life. When we leave our body, the uh, physical body ends, but the subtle body, which includes the mind, the intelligence, and the false sense of self, that means uh, whatever material identity we have in that life, those three things carry the soul, which is the subtle body, carries the soul to the next gross body, and you begin your next life. You have the same mind, the same intelligence, and the same conceptions and misconceptions you had from previous lives. And then you begin your next life again. So that's why, you know, people wonder what happened, why things are happening in a certain way. A lot of them is due to our desires and activities in previous lives. And they manifest in this life. Just like I'll give you an example. We had the story of in the, the Mahabharat, where in... Um, uh, Dhritarashtra was uh, 
his sons, uh, the Kurus, were defeated by the Pandavas and all his sons were lost. And then when he finally understood that, you know, Krishna was the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Pandavas had taken the victory, he came to Krishna and said, my dear Krishna, can you tell me my karma? I was born blind and I had a hundred sons. All those sons were killed. So can you tell me why what was the situation? Krishna, of course, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, therefore he knows everything. And he said, my dear Dhritarashtra, 50 lives ago, 50, you were a hunter and you shot a flaming arrow into a nest of birds. And there were a hundred birds in the nest. They all died by the fire, but the mother bird got away when she was blinded by the fire. So that was his karma. And then Dhritarashtra said, well, 50 lives ago, why did it take 50 lives for me to get the reactions of my karma? And Krishna told him, because it takes good karma to have a son, it took you 50 lives to build up enough good karma so you could have a hundred sons and then your karma was able to cash in. And then he understood. Just like if you owe some money to someone or some agency and you don't have it, then you have to get the money. When you get the money, you can pay the debt. But in the meantime, you're trying to accumulate the money. So in the same way, karma works in a very uh, mysterious way. It's so mysterious that as when Krishna was asked to speak about karma, he said, the intricacies of karma cannot be understood. He said, it's too difficult to explain karma. And Krishna is saying it's too difficult. What he means is the complexity of karma and how it manifests. Why I'm born in a particular family. Why do I look like the way I look? Why do I have a certain nature? Why do I have certain likings and dislikings? Why am, yeah, why am I born a male or a female? All of these are all part of a collective karma that comes from previous lives. So, but these things are all material. The important thing is now, once we know, well, we know we're not this body. We have a mind, but we're not the mind. We have a body, but we're not the body. We're the driving force within the body, that is the soul. So now we want to give education to the soul and not to the mind and to the body. So we take care of the body and mind, but we educate the soul. The soul doesn't need education, but the mind needs to be pushed out of the way so transcendental knowledge can reach to the soul or to the mind of the soul because the soul also has a mind which is spiritual. Just like with the, the material body has a mind also, but it's material. So in controlling the mind, it takes a very strong sense of discrimination to choose the direction that we want to push the mind in. So most people, and we say that with, without, any, without any hesitation, most people are controlled by the mind. And they're always listening to their mind, and they're always doing whatever their mind tells them to do. And sometimes even, they even know that too, just like it says on the cigarette package, smoking kills, right? <laughs> I remember years ago when I used to travel, we w I would walk through the different airports. I remember especially when I would go through uh, Heathrow Airport in London. And then we'd, uh, we'd pass these different stores within the airport and they have big stacks of, you know, boxes of cigarettes there. And I remember it used to say that uh, smoking, uh, smoking is bad for your health. That used to be the statement. 
Then they changed it. Smoking causes emphysema. It causes problems with birth defects. It can cause problems with that lung cancer. So many things. Now they don't put anything in that. They don't put that on the package. They just put two words: smoking kills. That's all. You can see it in big bold letters. And guess what? The sales of the cigarettes are still up. <laughs> People will know that, they'll read it, they'll hear it, but they won't listen to it. This is the mind. The mind is so attached to enjoying in a certain way that when that attachment becomes regularly, even at good advice, a thief knows if I'm going to go out and steal, I could get caught, I could get killed, I could get punished, I could be put in jail, my life will be ruined, but he does that anyway. No, well, that's the mind. The mind can, there, that's an example, extreme example of an enemy. Uh, Anasuya will say, come to the temple, and you'll say, I have to go to a wedding. <laughs> and so, the mind will say, yeah, I've been to the temple many times, and the weddings don't come up so often. <laughs> so, you know, we always have a tendency to listen to the mind. <laughs> Uh, but that shouldn't be the case. Therefore, we have to listen to a higher authority, and that, and that higher authority comes by regularly hearing from Krishna, by regular hearing from, because this knowledge coming from Krishna is the treasure of the soul's advancement towards purification. Of course, the soul is never unpure, but the mind contaminates the soul by directing the soul in the wrong direction, that's all. It's just like, um, you could be clean and your clothes will be dirty, <laughs> but uh, at the same time, although you're clean, you're in dirty clothes, you look dirty. So the same thing, the soul, the soul is clean, pure, can never be touched by material energy, but directed by the rascal dirt mind who wants to enjoy temporary satisfaction in this world, the soul becomes dragged. You saw the, the little example that they use in the, uh, in the uh, Bhagavad Gita. It's a nice little analogy. There's a chariot, and on the chariot there's two people. One person is driving the chariot, and the chariot is connected by reins to the horses. There are five horses and uh, there's a driver and there's a passenger. So the chariot is the body, the horses are the senses, the reins are the mind, the driver is the intelligence and the passenger is the soul. <laughs> so the soul is being dragged by the mind from one place to another. So therefore, if we want to be successful in Krishna consciousness, this is what, we, so therefore we have to purify the mind and make the mind a friend. So how do we do that? Sravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Smarnam. By hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. But because the mind is so long-term connected with the material energy, it's not so easy to purify the mind. And even, even great personalities who have achieved high levels of spiritual life can also be victimized by one of the bad qualities that could enter into the mind. There was an example. There was one great orator on spiritual knowledge. He knew the Shastras well. He would go from place to place giving very expert explanations on the Shastras. And so one time he was in a public forum and he was giving a lecture and one very devoted lady, she came and she sat down in his lecture and sat in the back. And then uh, she, her name was Krishna Priya and uh, she was constantly chanting the holy name of the Lord. She was, you might say she was addicted to chanting. She was chanting, 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 chanting. And so this, this orator 
He, um, I mean, he was a great soul. He had reached a very high platform in devotion also. He saw her and he became offended because she sat in his lecture and she was chanting Japa. Now, she had the ability to chant Japa and listen to the lecture at the same time. <laughs> Otherwise, she wouldn't have been there. And uh, so he became annoyed and he publicly started to criticize her for acting in that way. She was humble and she, was, she remained silent and didn't respond to his criticism. But he committed an offense to her. And because of that offense, he fell from his spiritual position. Uh, although he was on a very high platform. So he became, what we say, affected by pride. And his pride led him to uh, speak something that was offensive to others. So there's an example of how even greats, we can call it great souls, or people who have reached a level, high level of spirit, the mind can also cause them to fall down. We have the example of Bart Maharaj who was in the forest. Uh, he was on the platform of Bhava. Bhava is the one stage just before the platform of Prema, or a love of God. And uh, he was there, and he was meditating and praying. He was about to leave his body by focusing on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He had given up his position as king. He was the famous King Bart, who actually, this planet was named after, it was called Bart Varsha, that same Bart. And he was in the forest, but what happened was, he saw a little deer, he saw a deer and she was pregnant and she was wa running, walking, and then a lion roared very ferociously. The deer got scared and jumped. She jumped over a stream and when she jumped, the baby fell from her womb. The mother died out of fear and now there was a little baby deer, a doe, and there was no mother. So Bart Maharaj, Bart Maharaj saw the whole thing and he felt compassion for this little baby deer who was out a mother, without a mother. So he took care of the deer. But what happened was he became absorbed in taking care of the deer and he started to neglect his spiritual practice. Alone in the forest with the deer and if you, as you read the pastime, he became so attached to that deer it became almost like his own child. And, uh, and he, uh, he actually, it describes his attachment was so strong, it was almost like a romance. <laughs> and the point was that the nature of a Vaishnava is they have a soft heart, a compassion. But his heart, soft heart was not guided by intelligence. Therefore he gave up his spiritual practice to take care of the deer. And when he died, he took birth as a deer in his next life. In other words, he fell from his spiritual position. But of course, as you read the story, uh, because he was such a great devotee, uh, Krishna gave him the intelligence that when he was in the deer's body, he understood why he had accepted the body of a deer. And therefore, he didn't hang around with other deers. He used to go and listen to the sages discuss Krishna, Krishna consciousness. And then when he left the deer body, he took another birth as Jada Bharat. And then in that birth, he went back home, back to Godhead. And that's the, it's in the fifth canto. It's a very, very, and in that story, there are many, many, many verses about the nature of the mind. And there's one particular verse that stands out. It's the, uh, do we have the Srimad Bhagavatam fifth canto here? Chapter 17. Because it gives a nice point in relationship to the topic. What, fifth canto, chapter 17. Which I believe is, uh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Fifth Canto, chapter 11, and verse number 17. Yeah. Fifth Canto, chapter 11. 
here, verse number 17. So it's the last verse in the chapter. And it says here, I'll read the verse. The, uh, this uncontrolled mind is the greatest enemy of the living entity. If one neglects it or gives it a chance, it will grow more and more powerful and become victorious. So one has to be diligent in controlling your mind because the more it remains uncontrolled, the stronger it gets and becomes powerful. And then it goes on to say, although it is not factual, it is very strong. It covers the constitutional position of the soul. O king, please try to conquer this mind by the weapon of service to the lotus feet of the spirit, your master and of the supreme personality of Godhead. Do this with great care. So this is an instruction by Judd Bart in his last life. And Prabhupada's first sentence is very interesting in the purport. There is one easy way by which the mind can be conquered. Neglect. Don't listen to the rascal. <laughs> the mind is always telling us to do this or do that, therefore we should be very expert in disobeying the mind's orders. Gradually the mind should be trained to obey the orders of the soul. It is not that one should obey the orders of the mind. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say that to control the mind one should beat it with shoes many times just after awakening and again before going to sleep. In this way one can control the mind. So when you get up, take a pair of shoes and beat your mind. And I've seen devotees do that. So it works, but not too hard because you, you might knock yourself out and then there's nobody to chant. This is the instruction of all the Shastras. And then Prabhupada says, if one does not do so, one is doomed to follow the dictations of the mind. Just like it says, yeah, I got a chant, but then I'm going I'm to get some messages on my cell phone. And, um, you know, okay. I'll do the cell phone Japa program. <laughs> Left hand on the cell phone, right hand on the bee bag. Okay. And that is called, <laughs> what is that called? Insanity. Now, another bona fide process is to abide strictly by the orders of the spiritual master engaged in devotional service then the mind will be automatically controlled. Srila Chait Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has instructed, Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhogivana Ji Guru Krishna Prasade Pai Bhakti Lata Bij. When one receives the seed of devotional service by the mercy of Guru and Krishna, so to get to the point of devotional service, it's given by the mercy of Guru and Krishna one's real life begins. Yesterday we had a nice initiation of two daughters of, of Parikshit Prabhu and Anasuya. And they accepted initiation from one of my dear God brothers, Ritavaja Maharaj. So it says here, the, the one begin, the seed of devotional service is given by the Guru. And when that seed is planted, and one waters it by the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, then one makes progress in devotional service. If one abides by the orders of the spiritual master, by the grace of Krishna, he is freed from the service of the mind. Hmm. We, but, you know, sometimes we just like what our mind does, you know. <laughs> He's not a bad guy. <laughs> but we have to be able to, just like thoughts come in and out of the mind, so just like if you look up into the sky, you'll see that there are things that appear to be in the sky, just like, what is it? You see clouds, you see birds, you see planes, and there may be other objects also in the sky. 
but nothing touches the sky. They appear to be in the sky, but they are not touching the sky. The sky is vast, and the objects are just moving. I'll give you another example. Just like the wind will, will flow, and it'll go through a, a, a very unpleasant place, and it'll pick up that odor, and then take it. And then once it gets past that area, and goes to a rose garden, it picks up that odor. So the air is not, pick, is not contaminated by those. It just picks it up and drops it as it moves. So the thoughts of the mind are coming in and out. And the soul is like that sky, which is untouched by the, by the images that come into the mind. But the mind is uh, always bringing in these images, and the soul is actually identifying with these images. So we should be able to, therefore it says that a, a serious devotee always watches his mind. Doesn't allow the mind to do whatever it wants to do. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita in the same chapter, whenever and wherever the mind wanders, due to this unsteady and flickering nature, one should bring it back under the control of the self. So one has to control the self the mind by controlling it by higher knowledge like that and if you do that during the day your mind starts to become Krishna conscious and when you go to sleep at night you won't have all these crazy dreams <laughs> because crazy dreams are simply due to our material contamination in this life or in past lives and after a while these all of these things will cease and uh, as we, the power of Krishna consciousness develops more and more. So this is a little bit about the mind. There's much more we can speak about the mind. And Krishna explains a lot of that in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. That whole chapter is called Dhyana Yoga. Dhyana means meditation. Meditation, and there's where the mind comes in. So, um, you know, as Prahlad Maharaj told his father, you know, your only, your only enemy is your own mind. So the conditioned soul makes friends and enemies based on what the mind dictates, like that. When the mind changes, the situation changes. Jai, Shishi. Jagannath Baladev Subhadra Gornitai Nishriya Dev Ki Jai. So one has to, and the best way to control the mind is Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. It which requires a great amount of practice continually to chant. And that purifies the mind purifies the intelligence, purifies the senses. But it has to be done regularly because we have been maya davase, kachyo base, kachyo ha bubu dubai, jeev krishna das, hey vishwash, kalidana dukha nai. Many, many lives we've been in this material world. Karanam guru sangha syo sarasa joni jannasa. Sometimes in a good material situation, sometimes in a not so good material situation. We always have to understand that the mind is such a conditioned element that even for those who are practicing devotional service for many years still fail to control the mind. So it's, um, it requires diligence and regular, regulated devotional practice. We have to hear and chant. Otherwise, we will not be able to realize Krishna. And if we waste this life simply pandering to the, the, the entreats of the mind, then we have to come back in the next life and start again. And let, we'll leave off our life. And coming back is not so easy. You have to take birth again. Birth means going into the womb for nine months and being stuffed into that little sack where you can hardly breathe. 
you don't know what mother kind of mother you're going to get. If you get a mother that's not so nice, you know, you might have a hard time. If you, you might wind up in a, a mother that's not a human. <laughs> so, you know, we don't know what will happen next life. So this life is so, it's so important that we, we must become Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, we will be wasting this life. And that takes work. We have to work on becoming Krishna consciousness. And uh, the mind has to be always controlled constantly and directed towards... There's three ways, it's mentioned, there's three ways you can control the mind. He mentioned some of the things you can do, but in a broader category of understanding, the three ways is one, is to always meditate upon the instructions of the spiritual master. In other words, always think of the instructions of the spiritual master and how to carry it out. Because if we know, first we have to know those instructions, therefore we have to hear regularly and read the books. When we know, then we can, we can understand that each and every activity we perform throughout the day, there is an instruction that is relevant to that activity. It's not that the, the spiritual master, you read Srila Prabhupada's books, he gives everything from all angles of vision. And Prabhupada spent so much time instructing us, educating us, correcting us, directing us, and through the process of transcendental knowledge and through the practice of bhakti's yoga, the actual discipline that it requires. So both of these are important. So we meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master. Keep the spiritual master's instructions foremost, then the mind is controlled. Another way Prabhupada said here, which is very similar, one who is engaged constantly in serving the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, through the instructions of the spiritual master, the mind is controlled. And then there's another way, which is a little bit what we say generic, but it has an effect also. It says, work for the benefit of others. When one is always thinking how to benefit others, then the mind becomes controlled. Usually the mind is always telling us, you need this, go here, do this, don't do this, you'll be happy if you try this, you'll be, you'll be miserable if you listen to that person. It's always, the mind is always telling us this, that, this, that, this, that, this, that. So, but if we're always working for the benefit of others, then our mind is generally controlled. So we think in that in terms of, um, just like there was a statistics that was done many years ago. Well, who are the happiest people? And, uh, and it was was concluded that the happiest people were people who were busy in life, not lazy, <laughs> busy, using every moment, and who were serving others. These were the happiest people. They, were, they, they understood if they want to be happy, serve others. We also proud, we use that principle in devotional service. You want to be happy, serve the devotees. Serve the Lord, serve the spiritual master's instructions. All of this is a mood of contemplation by which the mind becomes elevated and fixed. And then the mind doesn't start thinking all of our problems. We have, you know, as soon as you let the mind go, it starts complaining about everything, right? <laughs> This is not right, he's not right, she's not right, I'm not right, this is not right. Nobody's right. <laughs> I'm trying to be right, but I can't do it. <laughs> the mind is always telling you, it's just complaining about everything, right? You know, you go, you work all day, you come home and your wife's complaining about everything, you know. <laughs> The wife's working all day to serve the husband. He comes home and he's complaining. You, what are you doing? You're not doing nothing all day. You're just, you know, s sitting on the couch watching television. So you know, it, it's just everybody's always complaining about something. 
if you look around, every, everything is, every, all statements are a form of complaint. <laughs> because this is the nature of the material world, it's never right. And you can't make it right, even if you try. All you can do is get out of it by bringing your consciousness to the spiritual platform. And we were speaking that yesterday, that when we practice for what we want to be, we actually develop that consciousness even in this material world. So when we live in devotional service, we're not living in this material world anymore. Although our bodies and minds may still be in the realm of material existence, it's not, we're not acting in that realm anymore. We're acting on the spiritual platform. So we have to practice that. And of course, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord are a very powerful and most direct way by which the mind can be dir directed towards Krishna and feeling happiness from that. So we have to have what we call regular chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra every day. And we should also make a numerical vow for those of you who haven't done that, if you make a numerical vow and follow the process, you will be successful in developing Krishna consciousness. Stick to your numerical vow and gradually increase. When Prabhupada was giving initiations, he would say, do you agree to chant at least 16 rounds? And sometimes people would say, Prabhupada, I'm chanting 16 rounds. Prabhupada said, no, that's not the idea. Minimum. Minimum is 16 rounds. So for those of you who haven't reached that stage, gradually come to that stage. And once you come to that stage, then you can gradually increase more and more and more. Because the chanting is a direct, direct connection between you and Krishna through transcendental sound. It is very powerful and very purifying at the same time. So these are a few of the principles that are make up the mind. Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, many, the story of Mahavar, Maharaj Bhar, especially many, many verses on the mind. Also in the 11th canto, Krishna also speaks how to control the mind. Krishna gives a whole series of verses. And one thing he says, which is quite interesting, he says, controlling the mind is like controlling a horse. He said, if you pull too tight on the reins of the horse, the horse will jump. And if you don't hold tight enough, the reins are too loose, the, mind, the horse will go in any direction. So he's giving me a point, if you try, if you put too much pressure on your mind to try to control it, it may re revolt and go the opposite way. So one should gradually and regularly move the mind towards Krishna, like that. But in a regulated and a very consistent way. And then it's like holding the reins of the horse, but not pulling too hard and not, be, not being too relaxed where the horse goes where it wants to go. Keep that steady. So Krishna gives that in instruction in a series of verses about the mind. So yeah, if we once the mind is controlled, as it says, the super soul is already reached, and then um, you're free from the dualities of the material energy, and you are connected with Krishna through the process of bhakti. And bhakti is not limited to Sunday. <laughs> bhakti is every minute. <laughs> yeah. We have to practice devotional service at every minute. It's not like we take a break and then Sunday becomes, you know, God's day. <laughs> it has to be done 24 hours a day because the mind is always active and is always looking for opportunities to try to enjoy the senses in this material world. Okay. There's a few points to take note of. Any questions? Comments? Yes, okay. Do we have a microphone for... Uh
Yeah. Okay. I think it's still not on yet. Okay. A little bit louder. Okay. Mind is what? Mind. Yeah. Is a food activity in a physically manner. So if you know that is the control or if I in in case in physical consciousness that is you you're saying can you control the mind in a material world also? Is that your point? Yeah, yeah well no, no, because the material energy is not is not it's mutable, constantly changing. Well, Krishna and spirituality is fixed. Therefore, you have to direct it towards something that is uh, unmovable or it stays. Therefore, you can't really control the mind in the material sense because all you're doing is going from one sense up into another. That's, a, that's not a controlled mind. It's being controlled by the material energy due to your desire to enjoy the material energy. Um, the mind can only be controlled on the spiritual platform. Because the spiritual platform is steady, it's immovable, it's not changeable. Where the, mind, the material energy is always it's mutable. Krishna says that in the Bhagavad Gita. It's constantly moving. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, sometimes people think, well, I'll just direct my mind and I'll absorb my mind in making a lot of money. So my mind is controlled into the direction of money. But then again, it, all it, it looks like the mind is controlled, but the, it is being controlled by the sense objects. Sense objects are controlling the mind and the senses are going along with it. But that's another controlled mind. It's just filled with lust, anger, greed. And these things don't allow the mind to be controlled. Meditation, prayer, spirituality uh, absorbs the mind in a steady way, just like uh, there is different speeds of the mind. Sometimes the mind is very fast, sometimes the mind is very slow. And different parts of the mind indicate different types of thought processes. So the slowest part of the mind is called the delta waves. This is a scientific. So when the, when the mind goes down to the level of delta wave, it's similar to sleep. But it's also the same level as meditation. So delta, level of mind activity is the same as meditation and the same as sleep. Okay. In other words, the mind is very slow on that point. So that means slowing down the mind and focusing it on something that is immovable. Krishna, Krishna's holy name, the glories of devotional service, the glories of Krishna. These things are fixed on the spiritual platform. And then the mind is controlled, and the mind is slow, and you can control the mind. And the mind becomes reflective, thoughtful, discriminating, in a spiritual way, not in a material way. Question? Yeah. Any, any sense of 
any sense object the mind comes across. Yeah. Yeah. It means you got some work to do. <laughs> yeah. So that means you have to come and hear more about Krishna, chant more, hear more, and do some service. When you start doing service, then your mind starts to become more and more controlled. Then it becomes easier to control the mind when you are chanting. If you're not doing any service, any active service, then when you sit down to chant, it's going to be, it's going to be, you know, all over the universe. Yeah. And some of us have powerful minds, some of us have less powerful minds, some of us, our minds are not so powerful. It's all due to our past karma, but in any case still we have to direct whatever mental power is there towards Krishna. Just like we see the deity. Okay, so you take an image of the deity in your mind, you keep that image throughout the day. That's the reason why we take darshan. It's not only we're taking darshan of the deities and getting the mercy of the deity, but it becomes like a mental image that we can carry with us. And we can reflect on it throughout the day. And then you're there. When you think of Krishna, you're with Krishna. When you chant Krishna's name, you're with Krishna. And wherever your mind are is wherever you are. Prabhupada tells the story. Two boys are on the way to the prostitute's house. And they're walking along and then they pass the Sankirtan party on the way. So one boy says, oh, there's the devotees, they're chanting. I'll think I'll go and join the devotees. And his friend says, no, nah, I'm not going, I'm going to the prostitute. So they split up, one goes to the chanting, the other one goes to the prostitute house. So the, 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 the boy who went to the prostitute's house, he's there and he's thinking, you know, my friend's really intelligent. I'm wasting my life here. And he's using his intelligence for spiritual life. Boy, I'm just, a, I'm just so degraded. And then his friend is with the kirtan. Is, he's thinking, boy, my friend went to the prostitute and he's having a good time and here I am trying to chant. It's not working. So, who's better off? <laughs> You are where your mind is. <laughs> Just like I'm talking now and some of you are somewhere else, I can see that. <laughs> some of you are looking at cell phones, others are thinking, when's Prashadam? <laughs> others are thinking, I still forgot to do a few things today. When I get home, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, you know, our mind is always telling and directing it. So in, in hearing, there are what is called three, three stages. It's particularly when you hear a lecture, there are three stages. And the fourth stage is the, is the result of the first three stages. And this is from Padma Purana, and it explains that, the, that when you're hearing a lecture, first of all, you have to have faith in the speaker. The speaker is qualified to speak. The second is humility. That means to absorb what is being said without trying to filter it through your own misconceptions. <laughs> In other words, to be, what we say, open to what is being said. 
And the third one is called destroying the faults of the mind. That means wherever the mind wanders, bring it back. It's going to, you know, it's going to Pizza Town. It's going to the shore, thinking, oh my God, the weather is bad and I'm planning a vacation. Uh, so we're all, <laughs> yeah, the mind is everywhere. It's just going everywhere. So that's a, these are called faults of the mind. So when you're listening to the lecture, you constantly bring your attention back to what is being said. And you're hearing, and you're thinking about what is being said as you're hearing. And if you do that, you're actually connected to the sound. And what is the result? You get two results. One of two or, or both. Generally, you get one of two. One is that you realize the knowledge that you're hearing, it becomes a realization. Yes, this is correct. You understand it. And the other one is questions. So if you're listening to a lecture and you don't get realizations or questions, it means you weren't listening. One of the two has to be there. So I hope you all got realizations. <laughs> But if you don't, but then again, if you're really listening, questions will also appear. Like that. Because the speakers don't always speak in detail, they speak in points. And detail comes through questions and answers. And then it becomes relevant to us. Like that. So we always inspire that, that process of asking questions based on what you hear to get a clearer understanding of the points. Any questions? More questions? Anasuya, you had a question? Or oh, is the question over here? Yeah. Go ahead. Right. fear that comes from allowing the mind to do the wrong thing? Yeah, I think, uh, the, the, the possibility that the mind will do the wrong thing so you're holding tight to the reins. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course in some situations it requires determination to uh, keep the mind from going into the wrong direction or going into the direction by which the situation is pulling us in. And therefore we have to remember Krishna. The easiest way to control the mind is to remember the Lord. And Prabhupada makes a nice point. He says, you will never be impeded in your execution of devotional service, if you remember the lotus feet of Krishna. And as soon as you remember Krishna's lotus feet, automatically everything will automatically flow in the right direction. Because by remembering Krishna's lotus feet, you're remembering Krishna. And when you're remembering Krishna, you're with Krishna. So we have to practice to remember Krishna. Of course, the easiest way is to chant. But then again, throughout the day, we can also reflect on Krishna, the personality of the Godhead in the form of his, you know, transcendental form. You know, his beautiful eyes, his peacock feather, the way he dresses, the way he stands, his lotus feet, the way they are positioned, all of these things are, me are forms of meditation. <laughs> forms of contemplation. Mm -hmm. And don't think you won't get your day-to-day -day job. 
Some people think if I think of Krishna, then I won't get anything done. <laughs> no, actually, when you think of Krishna, it becomes more natural to uh, perform the activities you need to perform. Even your daily activities of maintaining your, your material life becomes natural and easy. Because Krishna doesn't discriminate in that sense. So, yeah, it's just coming back to remembering Krishna. Pulling two hearts on the reins means forcing the mind. And lo too loose means allowing the mind to go wherever it wants to go. But then there's that constant guidance that comes from the intelligence. That you have to, you have to turn on that channel of bringing the intelligence into your consciousness by remembering Krishna, remembering the words of the spiritual master. When you find yourself in a situation, you can also uh, apply the knowledge that applies to that situation. Just like sometimes you're in contention with another person. How do you act? You know, you can act wrong and make the situation wrong, or worse, or you can act right and, and sort of ameliorate the whole situation. So then we have to reflect. You know, so it takes, uh, therefore, the problem is that in the Western society, everything's so fast. You, if you lived in India, you know think life is slower. <laughs> and, of course, but now, of course, it's being affected by the whole Western mindset. But people were slower because generally uh, they were more Krishna, they were more spiritually oriented. So a spiritual oriented person is more thoughtful, a material person is spontaneously engaged in material activities. <laughs> and become some Raganuga Maya, you know. <laughs> so yeah, this the Western say everything is so fast. Prabhupada tells the story of Ravindanath Tagore, remember him? Ravindanath Tagore. So he went to London and he was saying the people were walking so fast. He said, oh my God, they're walking so fast. The island is so small, they're going to fall into the ocean. <laughs> Everything is so fast. And that's the way we live. We go from, it's like everything is fast, fast, fast. Like that. One thing after another, after another. It's just the mind is, is on that, what we say. Getting things done fast, fast, fast. And that's the way the society is pushing. But to practice spiritual life, it takes community, it takes association. It takes the, the culture of Krishna consciousness to be imbibed. So we, when we practice Krishna consciousness, we can actually think how to do things and not be dragged simply by the, the dictations of the mind. So yeah, just remember Krishna, that's the answer. <laughs> Try to remember Krishna. And if you're always remembering Krishna, then you will never be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And even if you are, you'll be easily able to overcome it. Which one? Sure. The verse? Um, uh, one question. Actually, I also wanted to ask a question about the analogy you gave about divorce. Hmm. Um, the old tight in the reins. Too tight. Too tight, yeah. Later on, you said it meant forcing the mind. Yeah. yeah and Krishna uses the analogy of a horse. If you pull it too tight, it'll jump. I mean, it's going to jump, and if you let it too loose, then the horse will just go everywhere it wants. So, if you, my question is, if you regulate your day 
but this time I do this, this time I do this, and so on. Would that be analogous to keeping the veins steady? On yeah. Board? Yeah, regulation is, Krishna also mentions that in the Bhagavad Gita. That by regulating the senses, then one can overcome uh, the, the greatest enemy, lust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so regulation is important. But one should, one should strive for regulation but not be attached to regulation. In other words, one should regulate one's life, but one should not be fanatically attached to the regular. One should be able to see how, what is important if I have to break my regulation in order to do something that is just like a person will be saying, well, yeah. Um, so let me give you an example. Now you might, you might be, say you're in the temple and you're chanting your rounds and then some temple authority comes up and says, well, well, uh, we need you to do this service now. It's important. It's in relationship to the deities. You say, well, my, this is my regulated japa time. <laughs> so, as somebody else. <laughs> so, then that means you're, you're attached not to Krishna, but to your own regulation. So there are circumstances which uh, may appear which may be more important at that time and therefore one has to be able to see that and discriminate. But that's, these are not necessarily things that are happening regularly. They don't happen regularly. The once you regulate, that'll be the more constant in your life. That's a material example, that's all. Yeah. But it also works in Krishna consciousness. In other words, it takes the, your mind off yourself all the time. Always thinking about yourself. I'm getting this, I'm not getting that. And then you start making other person's concerns your, your concern. And then you, you're, you're helping others, and at the same time, you're also helping yourself. There's two ways to solve a problem. One is to solve it, and the other one is to forget about it. <laughs> Which one is better? They're the same. <laughs> Yes, honestly. Uh, yeah. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Uh, my, my question is when you were mentioning that, uh, I think you said that the easy way to neglect the mind. This is what Prabhupada mentions in that first line. He says, this is, there is one easy way to control the mind, neglect. And then he expands. He said, the mind is always telling us what to do. So one has to learn to neglect the demands of the mind. That's one, that's one way. It's not the only way to control the mind. My question, Marge, is, you know, with the reference to what Prabhupada said, how ultimately can we Well, you have to understand what is the difference between material and spiritual. What is the difference between what is to be done and what is to be avoided? So that takes some discrimination. Discrimination is based on using your intelligence to understand the instructions of the spiritual master and Krishna. When you guide the intelligence in that direction, 
then you have the the right understanding of how to apply things in every circumstance. It may not always be perfect, but you're and you're you're developing the perfect process. Because you have to understand to control the mind is not you even if you decide to control the mind, say, Wow, I heard this class today at the temple, I'm gonna really control my mind. Good luck. <laughs> it's going to take some work. <laughs> it's not going to happen overnight. You have to really, I mean, continue to work on it. <laughs> and gradually the mind becomes a friend. Gradually. It doesn't happen overnight because, as we mentioned, the mind is very conditioned by its past activities, both in this life and in previous lives. And these, these elements for previous lives will also arise occasionally in, our, in this life. Sometimes they call them idiosyncrasies, certain characteristics of a person's personality that may be flukes or flaws, but, or just something unusual. Where does it come from? It may come from our past karma. That's and then it's fixed. Now, now it will move. It's this guy. Yeah. I didn't just figure that out now. I knew that already. Any other, so is that is that okay? Who who was I? Is that your question? What was the question again? How do you differentiate the You have to know, but if you're not sure, just turn Hare Krishna. <laughs> really, I mean, all you have to do is connect again with the holy name, and then whatever's happening is gone, and then you're you're right, you're in the right place if you're not sure but then again the discrimination that needs to be applied in terms of the intelligence needed for each circumstance comes by hearing from Krishna hearing from the spiritual master that's why we have to hear from Krishna and the spiritual master regularly and that means reading Prabhupada's books hearing Krishna Prabhupada's lectures, hearing our spiritual master's instructions, all of these things. In a cumulative way, are all coming to the same point, directing us in the right way towards Krishna consciousness. Anything else? <laughs> can't catch all the words for some reason. Some of the words are missing. So when we say that control the mind, does it mean control the functions of the mind which are controlling one's thinking, feeling, and living? And then controlling, Control, by controlling constantly, what is the other words? Yeah, yeah. You control the thinking and then the rest will follow nicely. So do we adapt the thinking or do we adapt the function of the intelligence which is discrimination? Do we do, do we what? Do we attack the thinking or do we attack the functions of the, the intelligence which is discrimination? Yeah, well, the mind is, you never know where it's going to go. In the process of thinking, 
we, we connect with sense objects automatically in the external environment and all of a sudden the mind is there. So again, it's coming back with using the intelligence. Just like the mind might say, well, here's something to enjoy, and then the mind the intelligence will say, no, it's not like that, you're not gonna enjoy that. So then the mind and the intelligence comes in and gives us a clear understanding based on the knowledge that we receive from Guru, Shadow, Sadhu, and Shastra. So the mind, the, you can't change the process of thinking, but you have to purify that, that's all. And the functioning system is, is, is set, but the, what happens into the function, what do you think of Krishna or you think of sense objects, or if you think wrongly about a situation, all of this will have to be purified by, by the instructions coming from Guru and Sh Sadhu and Shastra. So you apply those things. Mm -hmm. You learn to. If, you see, it's not like you have to stop and think of everything. In the beginning, when you're first practicing this, it's a slow process. And then the mind starts to get conditioned in the right way, and then it becomes part of you. Once it becomes part of you, it becomes part of your character. You're changing your character from material to spiritual character, from material personality to spiritual personality. Then as you imbibe the right mood and the right qualities, then you're actually transforming. What are you doing? You're bringing the soul more into its own awareness. So then you're acting on the spiritual platform and not on the material platform anymore. But it's a process that has to be practiced and, uh, and the mind has to be watched. More. I mean, we say something and then we're sorry we said it, right? You know, I shouldn't have said that. Or even doing something with that we did this. something and then we regret we did something or didn't, you know, like that. Is this class too long? Half the people have already left. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you for correcting my mind. I have a question. I'm not sure. When you came from the water, I agree that you want to more. The more the problem starts, I think. When you achieve something, it's good. I also want to know. Is it good for you or not good for you? The question is, is it beneficial or unbeneficial? The discriminating factor has to see, is it going to help you in your spiritual practice or is it going to take you away? I mean, material life is that the more you're successful in performing your material duties, the more you will find more and more opportunities to increase in that area. And one of the things that is most addicting is the more money you make, the more money you're going to want to make. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a disease, I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, but it happens in all, every, uh, all, all categories. You, you go to work, and you're good at your job, and you're getting notifications from your employer that you're a good, good uh, employee. They're gonna give you more opportunities for advancement and for work hours, you know. So you're gonna, They'll give you more pay, they give you more responsibilities. So that's how material life works. Same in spiritual life. The more you practice this, the more you get opportunities for more service, more uh, opportunities to learn. And so whatever you put your attention on, if you're successful in that area, you can expect, you can expect that that area will expand automatically. It just happens. Material success leads to more, but spiritual success leads to more. Mm -hmm. 
It's, it's depending on where you want to put your attention. That's it. But then again, our attention is, is, is somewhat fueled by our desire. If we want Krishna, we can get Krishna, but if we want Maya, we'll get Maya. <laughs> But then we, the idea is changing your desire from, from Maya to Krishna. And that's the process. Anything else? Brett? Mm -hmm. Swami gives the gives the formula. Utsaha nistaya darya. Utsaha means enthusiasm. Utsaha nistaya means determination, and darya means patience. Um, so one has to practice the process enthusiastically. Be determined to continue despite the obstacles and reverses, and remain patient for the results. <laughs> And that, and that can be sublimated when one is uh, in association. In other words, by taking to the association of devotees, we automatically can remain enthusiastic. We have the tools, we have the environment to overcome the, the obstacles. We can, we can remain determined. And we're happy in the association of devotees, therefore we can be impatient. When you're happy, you're patient. <laughs> if you're unhappy, you're impatient. <laughs> so follow that. That's from Rupa Goswami's Upadeshamrita, verse number three. So number two, the six things that destroy bhakti. Verse three, the think six things that support bhakti. So the six things are enthusiasm, determination, patience, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, giving up the association of non-devotees, and following the process as given by the spiritual master. These are the six things that are favorable. The six things that are unfavorable, the devotional service is um, uh, overeating, over collecting material things. Um, what is the other? What's the second one? Project. Hmm? Let's see. Ah, aha. What is it? Pratyahara. Um, yeah. What is uh, Over endeavoring for mere material things that are unnecessary. Prajapa speaking nonsense, uh, uh, Niyamagraha, following the rules and regulations for the sake of following and don't know why you're doing it, <laughs> or rejecting the rules and regulations and acting whimsically and independently. Again, association with uh, asat, those who are non-devotees, and the last one is uh, laoyam, right? 
Mahayam, that means greed for mundane achievements. Mm -hmm. So these six things destroy bhakti. You study those two verses, and Bhakti Vinod Thakur has written a commentary on it. He's comprised a separate book on those two verses. It's called Bhakti Loka, and it's available in Krishna Consciousness. He's taking those 12 items and explaining each one of them in detail. If you know those, then you know what to avoid and what to uh, accept those things. So in your question, yeah, if you remain enthusiastic, and what does enthusiasm mean? Sometimes we misunderstand enthusiasm. We think enthusiasm means just running around as fast as you can. <laughs> But Rupa Goswami gives another definition. He says enthusiasm means to endeavor with intelligence. Apply the intelligence in every situation. Uh, and then determination, there will be obstacles. No matter who you are, or what situation in life you're in, you will meet obstacles. It's just the way life is, even in the spiritual realm. So learning how to see obstacles as, as mercy of the Lord, as opportunities to develop more of the qualities that are necessary for bhakti or to shed away some material detachments. And patience, patience is cultivated by transcendental knowledge. When you have knowledge, then you can be patient. If you know, don't, if you don't have the knowledge, then Circumstances will bewilder you and you won't know how to act. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are some of the principles. Um, so take that, Upadesh Amrita is only 11 verses, but the second and third verse is in the book Bhakti Loka by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. It's a really good, I give a seminar on that, those, those two verses. I haven't given that seminar in years, but um, yeah, it's a, it's a very important part of our devotional service, knowing what's favorable and what's unfavorable. You know, when you go to a job, you have to know what to do and what to avoid. When you're driving down the road, you have to know how to operate your car. You have to know what the signs on the roads mean. You have to know that red means stop, green means go, and yellow means hurry up before it becomes red. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, slow, means slow down. <laughs> so I'm just using that as an example to show that in every aspect of life there is a set of principles that are applied in order to do whatever activity, just like if when you're in marriage. If you think marriage is just coming together with the opposite sex and having kids, then you'll be, you'll miss the whole point and your marriage will be a mess. There are principles that have, that govern successful marriages and you have to learn those principles and apply. All, every aspect of life has been covered in the Vedas. Everything. From how to get up in the morning to how to go to bed at night. <laughs> Everything is there in the Vedas. How to live life both materially and spiritually. Practical, material uh, principles that make life, what we say, doable and spiritual activities which make our consciousness elevated to it. It's all there. The knowledge is available. If we make mistakes and we, we get bewildered by what happens, that means we just don't know why things are happening the way they are. That's why Prabhupada, he, he, he spent a very large part of his time giving us this knowledge in these books. It was his greatest contribution, these books. No, oh, read the books, hear the lectures, and then you'll be, you'll understand what to do and what to avoid.
And if you don't, just chant Hare Krishna, that's fine. 24 hours a day and then you're okay. <laughs> but we can't do that automatically. So we have to come gradually to that stage. Any other questions? I think we exhausted. One more? When you're engaged in a task? Uh, somehow, I, because the microphone system is not so good here, I can't hear anything. Um, uh, I think, just put the microphone down and speak. Yeah. Yeah. I, can I can hear Anasuya when she speaks, clearly. <laughs> but, I, but you can just speak, go ahead. Do you just speak? So I was saying before, but I found that you know, you know, you can hear me now. Yeah. So I was saying before, I found that you know, you can hear me now. 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 Directing the mind towards Krishna. Yeah. The mind will go wherever it wants to go, but the soul is looking for Krishna. And unless the mind cooperates with the soul, the mind will take you everywhere, away from Krishna. So the goal of Krishna consciousness is direct the mind towards Krishna. That's it. That's why we have a variety of activities. Hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, uh, serving Krishna, offering prayers to Krishna, worshiping Krishna, uh, becoming Krishna's friend. There's so many activities that make up devotional service all centered around connecting the mind to Krishna. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Become Krishna conscious. <laughs> if you're Krishna conscious, you're happy. If you're Krishna consciousness, you are free from all the anxieties that come by way of living in this material world. Now a spiritual person may have anxiety, but they're spiritual anxieties. Like, I want to do more service, I want to do better service. So there's a type of anxiety that comes with that, but that's spiritual and that's good. That's, that's, then usually people who are on that level, they're very advanced. They, they think that their service is not good enough and they want to do better or more service. That's, um, that is a very high level of spirituality. But then when you apply it in a material way, it's just the opposite. The anxiety of living in this material world and still trying to be happy. So directing the mind to Krishna, that's all. That's our whole process. Everything centers in the mind. Therefore, in the... It's in the Mahabharata, but it's mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita that there's a verse, I don't know if maybe if you can remember that verse. Um, um, I can't remember the actual Sanskrit. But the translation is, <clears throat> all the rules and regulations of devotional service culminate in two principles. Always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. So everything we do is meant to bring us to that thing. So always remember Krishna and never forget Krishna. And that's the goal of all the rules, all the regulations, all the activities. There's 64 rules and regulations, but these two are the sum total of all 64. Always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna.
And Krishna is attractive. He's a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll help you too, don't worry. You're trying to remember him, he will help you. You're trying to forget him, he will help you also. <laughs> That's that's the sum total of all all spiritual practices. Who knows that verse? Anybody know that verse? It's, uh, it's from the Mahabharata, but it's it's in. I think it's in Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila, chapter twenty-two, verse one thirteen. Do we have that Madhya Lila? Oh, it's a beautiful verse. And yeah, you got it. Yeah, that's the verse. Can you read the translation? Regulations in the Shastras are servants of these two principles. Always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. <laughs> 113. It's from the Mahabharata, but it's placed in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Okay. So that was two hours and one minute. <laughs> that was a long class. <laughs> but the subject matter is quite extensive, so we can discuss the principles of the mind forever. Okay, so remember one thing, never trust your mind. <laughs> Only trust <laughs> okay, thank you. You're both bad, Kijai. You found the verse?